Well, hello there! Are we live, hello. guys, or are we live? How's everyone doing? Is everyone getting in there? Are you getting in the chat? <laughs> I see people showing up here. Guys, how are we doing? Well, Sasumi says, oh, wait a second. Are we live, Hello. guys? Or are we? There we go. I was pumping my own stream back into you guys. Caroline says hello. Hello, Caroline. Well, guys, listen. It's back. We're back. The Reason live stream. Some of you are going to be new people. You're, you're joining because of Stardew Valley and, and uh, you're fans of Eric's work. Some of you guys are Reason fans and the whole live stream concept is new to you. And some of you are return customers. You have been with us back in 2020. We started the Reason live stream and you were with us all through 2020. And to, to those who are just joining us, welcome. To those who are back, welcome back. We are so pumped to be doing this again. You know, somebody asked a question in the, I put out a trailer for the Reason live stream and they said, you know, in December of 2020, you said like, we're going to take a little hiatus. We'll be back eh, maybe in a few weeks. And then like, where'd you go? You never really came back. And uh, I, I suddenly felt like, I felt like that the dad who like goes out for milk and then never returns to his family. I was like, Oh no. Um, so I am, uh, I'm thrilled to be back. I'm back with the milk. I'm dad's back. No, that's a, a weird metaphor, but I am thrilled to be back doing this again. And what we've done, we've sort of reworked the live stream. If you were watching the reason live stream in 2020 and you were enjoying it, um, we took this hiatus uh, because we had other projects that we were sort of trying to figure out. And we weren't quite sure how to work the live stream in because it's, it's kind of a lot of stuff to be prepping every week. And so what we did this time is we've conceived of the live streams more like seasons of TV. So this is season two now of the Reason live stream. And we're going to be doing live streams up until June-ish, um, early June, basically, maybe mid-June. We've kind of got our schedule laid out. We may add an episode here or there. But we've got it all planned out, and it's all on our blog. So anybody who wants to see who's coming up on the Reason live stream, definitely go check out ReasonStudios.com. If you guys are new, if you're Stardew Valley fans that are just here to check this out for Stardew Valley, but you're also interested in music, also hang around with us because we've got a whole season of live streams that I think are going to be really fun. We've got uh, coming up, we've got Toro y Moi, who is a fantastic musician. We're going to be talking to him about his process and how he makes music. We've got this producer, Jake Magnus, who just did uh, the uh, Machine Gun Kelly record, Bloody Valentine. He's going to be joining us. Uh, uh, from Marion Hill, Jeremy Lloyd is going to be joining us. We've got uh, Sarah Spencer, who's going to be talking about, she runs a, a website called Song Club, where she helps songwriters kind of stay creative, and, and she's going to be joining us as well. So there's a whole season of stuff that is going to be super fun. So uh, absolutely thrilled to be with you guys here. I'm going to pull up some comments and just see uh, what everybody's saying and doing. Um, good to have you back. Yeah, it's good to be back. Absolutely. Um, and oh, there we go. Boing, I've missed these live streams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Reason. Absolutely. So good to be back. So, oh, look at this. Um, we've got Arnica Montana playing Stardew right now. That seems like a probably good way to to multitask here. Maybe uh, maybe everybody should just pull up uh, you know two screens and watch the live stream while they're while they're farming. So um, well, listen, I don't want to um, I don't want to hold up the main attraction here, especially if you know for people that are, are tuning in to see uh, Eric Baroni and talk Stardew Valley for sure. So with that said, why don't we? bring on our guest for this morning or evening or whatever time it is on your little corner of the globe um, and say hello and we'll, we'll kind of get down to brass tacks here. So Eric, say hello to the internet. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> hi, hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Of course. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, we are thrilled to have you here. And, you know, we were thrilled, as I think a lot of people were, in when we publicized that you were going to be a guest on the reason live stream, the assumption was obviously then that you are a reason user, you work in reason and, you know, watching people in our uh, feed going, 
Stardew Valley was done in reason? What? You know, in fact, there were some people that started thinking because uh, I think you tweeted it last Friday that you were going to be on the show. And there are people going like, nah, this is an April Fool's joke. Ah, yeah, we're not... We're not falling for this. Yeah, I've never done an April Fool's prank. I'm completely honest and genuine. I've been using Reason for like 15 years. So it's it's a huge part of my life with the amount of time I've spent making music. Um, I've spent a lot of hours in Reason. Right. And right. yeah, the entire Stardew Valley soundtrack was made using Reason. Well, we were thrilled when we we heard that, you know, the, the folks over in the Stockholm office heard that. And, you know, it's it's a sort of weird thing being the manufacturer as it were of a music software because you you well i mean it may, there might even be parallels to the the game development world you sort of make this thing and then you put it out into the world and you're no longer in control of what people do with it and the experience that they have with it and the relationship it has to their life what it means to them and all that and you and you don't you don't know you know like when you're as a creative and you know, because you're probably a musician, you may have had this experience younger in your life. Early, early on in the creative process, you directly interact with the people who are experiencing your creative output. You know, you learn a song on guitar and you play it for your parents and they go, hey, good job or whatever. You know, there's like, there's that very direct feedback. And then the, there's this disconnect that comes from success where suddenly you don't, you don't have that relationship anymore. So when we find out that people are reason users, it's sort of that, it's that little like thread back to that direct connection of like, oh, okay. So Eric was out in the world. He tried reason. He liked it. He started making music with it and he's done stuff with it. And, and then we finally get that feedback. So it was, it was definitely fun to uh, experience that. I would imagine it's similar for you that when Stardew Valley becomes bigger than you could ever imagine it, where it's no longer yours anymore, almost it's, it's the world's, you know? True. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I've used an analogy before of it's, it seems like it's kind of like if you have a kid and they're growing up, you know, you're the main person in their life, but then at some point they leave and they kind of form a life of their own and they start doing things that you're not involved with. And, uh, they're still your child, of course, and right. you love them and you have a special connection, but they've become their own person at this point. Right. That's kind of how I feel about Stardew Valley. You know, it's Stardew Valley's grown up and it, it has its own life now that's somewhat separate from me. Right, right. It's, but, uh, and I guess, um, you know, if to use the child metaphor, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, you're, it seems like you're working on your next child. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, <laughs> True. That's, you got a bun in the oven, as it were. Um, well, let's, um, let's, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk Stardew Valley. We're going to listen to some stuff from Stardew Valley. But I'd love to kind of wind the clock back a little bit with you because uh, I think, well, first of all, for anyone that doesn't know, maybe I should just restate, you know, your sort of the, the, the need to know Cliff's Note version of your, of what you are and what you do in terms of Stardew Valley. What is not entirely unique to indie game development is that you created this game solely on your own. What is sort of unique to indie game development is that it became this multi-million copy selling juggernaut. Um, and that's probably less common that something of that uh, level of success is the product of literally one person's creative output and effort. And so if I could sort of pull back to even before Stardew Valley was a concept, when you were just kind of, I guess, a kid, I mean, you're not, you're, you're fairly young still. So when you were a kid kind of coming up, I would imagine you were always a bit of a sort of polymath, uh, sort of creative, but creative in multiple outlets. Is that correct to assume? Yeah, it's true. I've always been uh, into art of all kinds. Um, music was probably always the biggest thing for me. And, uh, you know, in, my parents got me this little Casio keyboard when I was a kid that I would mess around on and write my own little songs. And, and then, um, you know, in high school, I was in bands, I played guitar and all that stuff. And I, I always kind of wanted to be a musician, but at the same time, I would also like, you know, do art just kind of, it, this was all amateur level stuff. You know, I never had any formal training in any of this, but I would always kind of just doodle around with various things, music, art, writing, whatever. Right. And I, I never really thought that, I would be able to combine all of this into one thing, but it turns out that, you know, video games were kind of the perfect way to combine all those different things that I just kind of did for fun. 
uh, into one cohesive package. Right, right. So in, on the music side, though, um, what is what is young guitar playing Eric listening to? What is the what's on, I guess I would say Spotify playlist, uh, <laughs> but what was in your LimeWire downloads folder? <laughs> well, in, in high school, I was into like uh, like metalcore. Oh, OK. That kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, I was in, you know, like the kind of. Yeah, mostly like metal, like Kill Switch Engage. Like yeah. that was my favorite band in high school. Um, I love and, that. And like, I love that just because of how if you had to pick the exact opposite of the Stardew Valley soundtrack, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you get. True, true. Well, when I was a real small kid, my parents like played a lot of classical music. Okay. So that was kind of like, uh, you know, I guess kind of maybe deeply ingrained inside of me was kind of classical music. And then I played a lot of like uh, JRPGs as a kid. So I kind of had that music was kind of also influential to me. OK. Um, and that was even like earlier childhood. So that might be more kind of core, you know, to what my influences are. I see. Right. Um, right. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's it actually is the maybe the teen years is the wrong time to look at. That's when you. Um, are starting to branch out a little bit in your in your music, trying new things and kind of getting in. You know, plus it's you know your angsty teen years. That's when you listen to the <laughs> the metal. Sure. Um, but yeah, you're right. That that earlier stuff probably does play a, a big influence. Um, and so your so you kind of came your early creative output then is sort of music and exploring music. Uh, I presume then that you got into uh, the computer side of things, the coding and that sort of thing, just out of uh, sort of vocational training, as it were. I mean, you went to college for um, a computer science degree or something, or, or was that where that came from? Yeah, I mean, like programming was never a big uh, like hobby of mine or anything. It was. It, I did make like a game that was kind of for uh, a band I was in. Uh huh. Oh. But it, it, I kind of just figured out how to do it using like a. It was called like I think Adventure Game Studio or something. So mm. it was kind of like software that you would use to make a game. Right. Um. So it was kind of always on my radar, I guess, but I never really thought like, yeah, I was going to be a game developer or anything like that. That kind of just happened because I, I went to college and I didn't really know what to major in. And I had taken a class at community college, like a programming class, and I was like pretty good at it. And I thought it was kind of fun. So I was like, eh, whatever, I'll just major in computer science. Right. And then right. It, it was while I was at college that I kind of started making games like on the side, just kind of as something to do and to get better at programming. And uh it was fun for me because it allowed me to use like the music and art and all that stuff that I kind of like to do anyway. Right. So that, that's kind of what then eventually, uh, you know, uh, materialized into Stardew Valley down the road. Gotcha. You know, I, um, I, I really relate to this in a, in a lot of ways. I am a musician. I also, uh, my early twenties worked as a, a coder, as a developer, um, before I was really kind of rolling with more music and video projects, you know, sort of fresh out of college, like what are the jobs? I need a job. What's going on? You know? And, and I got into it as well, kind of in, in a non-traditionally trained sort of way. But what I, early on, what I loved about was sort of wearing both those hats of music and coding. My first impression of it was I liked the, the difference that code is to a degree binary. It works or it doesn't. Music is, entirely subjective and interpretable, you know, so it works for some people, it doesn't work for others, you know, and I sort of liked having that moment where I'm working in a sort of rigid world where, you know, when I hit compile, that's either going to run or it's not going to run. Then as I got deeper into it, I came to actually find the blurring of the lines where actually coding is not exactly, there's not one way to do anything. And so there's a, there's almost a creative aspect to the way that you might code something. And I started seeing these sort of weird metaphorical parallels between the two. And I would imagine you might've, what I would imagine is that you probably, if this makes sense, code like a musician, you know what I mean? Rather than a coder. Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably true. My, my code is known for being uh, notoriously messy. It's, uh, spaghetti code they call it you know it kind of goes all over the place right um it, it's more intuitively coded i would say than uh meticulously methodically or uh super logically coded but basically my style is like you know if it works it works get it to work you know right right that is but i think there might be some like you know music to, to compose music i feel like there is a certain mathematical element to it yeah yeah. You know, it taps into a certain part of the brain that has like a 
a mathematical slant, which you might also use for coding. So I don't know. I know. I feel like I wouldn't be that surprised if there were a lot of like musician slash coders. Right. Right. Maybe more so than like artists slash coders. But. Right. Right. That may be true. I'm uh, I'm just going to throw out a, a question to the audience here. So I'm, I'm kind of watching comments as they come in and uh, people are saying there's someone that needs to get banned. And I'm looking to see who it is in the comments, uh, someone that is spamming the comments. So guys, um, feel free to like, you know, snitches don't get stitches. So narc on whoever it is that you're mentioning, because I'm kind of scanning to see who it is and I'm not seeing a name. So just let me know. What are, uh, they, what are they spamming? 1.5 mobile? <laughs> there's a, there, oh, there's a good deal of that. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, is, that a, is that a topic we shouldn't even, third rail we shouldn't even discuss? Or <laughs> We can talk about it. I mean, it's, it's fine, but I know pe there's a lot of people. Uh, I saw that when the tweet went out too, and it was like 1.5 mobile. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it was uh, in, a, in a weird way, Eric, it was um, refreshing to see that that, um, enthusiasm, we'll, call, we'll use the positive word, say that enthusiasm is universal to your world as it is to ours. The, you know, when we, whenever we put out new content, we get comments like VST3 support and track folders and, you know, people shouting their, <laughs> yeah. their feature requests. At least people uh, care about the software enough to be, you know, exactly, that passionate. Exactly. That's, replies, that's the yeah. way we see it too, is that like the worst thing would be that we put out a content and just people, nobody cares and nobody, nobody has anything to say about it. So um, well, so now just to, just to talk a little bit more about so this, this multifaceted thing that you do, you, the music makes sense. The coding, I saw that the graphic design. I mean, you did that, the story elements, you did all this stuff. And, and what, I guess we are seeing the first big output, but obviously like you're saying, you were doing little games kind of here and there coming up, but your, your graphic design chops are just right on point i mean they they don't look you don't look at the game and go like oh i get it it's a guy who knew how to code and could do music and he fudged the <laughs> graphics you know it's like it looks totally well, great thank thank you I, I appreciate that uh yeah i mean the the art was maybe the hardest thing for me and uh, something that i had to spend a lot of time uh just to get decent at it um especially pixel art it's like a very because i i like did a lot of doodling when i was you know a teenager and right when i worked you know like uh minimum wage jobs i'd kind of like be like you know doodling when no one was looking and stuff but uh um pixel art is its whole like a whole new thing that's very unique and it has its own skills that you have to learn and so that it took me a very long time to get competent at that yeah and i still feel like i'm not that good and i have a lot of room to grow still and i still think i'm getting a lot better at pixel art every day you know right. working on my new game too i have um in front of me here and people can't see because it's on the other side of the camera but i have this um limited edition prints that i bought from uh, an artist named susan Kerr, who was the icon designer of the original macintosh icons so the the trash can and the the little happy mac and the floppy disk i've got those three icons that she has and sort of blown up pixel art prints and i i so respect the that art of taking something and distilling it down to i don't know you're probably not working still in 32 by 32 pixel sprites but um it's effectively that sort Smaller. of <laughs> oh really are you I mean, Stardew is 16 by 16. Oh, shit. There you and go. actually, my new game is, too. So Really? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's the, the, the sort of creative choices you have to make there are... And again, I can't help but draw parallels to music. But it, in the same way, if anybody has ever done things like four-track recording... Four-track recording is like... Or maybe even less, but it's, that's like the pixel art of music, where you have to make these, like very key reductive choices of you know or actually you know maybe the even more appropriate one is um chiptune music which often uses mm. like three tracks you've got like a triangle wave a sawtooth wave and a sort of percussion noise track and it's like, yeah i actually have a little bit of experience with that um i was working on this project for a while that never really materialized but it was uh to make a a game that would actually be on a super nintendo cartridge like, so it was to the actual spec of what a Super Nintendo game would be. And I was making some music for that. So it's like, I had to deal with that kind of stuff. Like right. the, there was very limited constraints that you could only do a certain, certain stuff with it. But right. I actually find that kind of fun. It's like, a, 
it's like you're playing a game and there's rules to the game. You know, it's like when, when I boot up reason, it's like infinite possibilities. So sometimes that's like overwhelming. I, I almost yeah. wish that it was like here, you have to use this one instrument and like figure it out, make something good. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. You're, you're sort of solving a puzzle. In fact, we have had over the years, we put out some mobile apps. Uh, we had one called figure. We have uh, reason compact, which is a sort of reduced version of reason. And those are more of that idea where you have three three elements you got a bass drums and a and a melody and it's like what can you do with it and what has blown my mind is what people do do with it because they can push that so far beyond in the same way that you know those early chiptune people were doing things that are just incredible and i actually i had to do a project a, a little freelance project where i was making sort of mega man 2 style chiptune music and i was analyzing how that original stuff was done and when you really do look at the score and you start looking at like, oh, I see the bass line is both the bass line, but it's also the harmony for the melody. And it has to like do double duty in that way, you know, and, and the, yeah. oh, the drums actually like sometimes the ride cymbal is being used actually as like a, a transitional sound, you know, that's sort of bridging the gap between two sounds. So it, it, it is, you're right. It's the, when forced into constraints, it, it you know, I always think of it as, uh, you know, when you hold your thumb over the garden hose. You actually are restraining the water, but it actually shoots out for faster yeah, and harder. Yeah. That's how I feel about creative restraints like that. And I, I wonder, is there a tip that you have for people that do have that experience when they open up Reason and it's a blank canvas and you can go anywhere? Do you have any, is there any creative tricks that you use to sort of impose, self-impose limitations? Um, well, I mean, I'm actually very... Uh primitive with my reason use i mean i i think uh i i, I kind of i'll just stick to like you know and and an xt a lot i'll use that a ton and so it's like i mean there, there's not really a special trick that i do except that um i don't know i just i just keep it real simple to begin with and then i just kind of let it organically go from there right but it's usually what I'll do is I'll start with, you know, very rudimentary stuff and then I'll save the fancy stuff for later. And then it'll kind of like, as I keep listening to it over and over again, then I'll start adding more. So when you see my project, you'll see like some of them are quite, there's like, you know, a lot of tracks, there's a lot of stuff going on. But when I started, it was very small and kind of like, I, you know, it's like, I don't know how a lot of people make music, but for me, it's like I usually don't have the idea in my head beforehand. I'll just boot up Reason and I'll start like messing around with it. And then something will kind of just organically evolve out of that. You must have had, yeah. though, uh, a sense um, when you were working on the music. That, I mean, the, the music so matches the vibe of the game and, and sort of the era, the homage that Stardew Valley is to. Uh, I, so I'm I have to admit here, I'm not uh, a current gamer. I am a, uh, you know, child of gaming that, you know, sort of. I guess aged out of it or whatever. My brother kind of went with it. He's a, a game composer, works in the industry. But um, I, th when I see Stardew Valley, I just go, "Oh, hey!" Like I played these games in the '90s. You know, this is a very sort of that early console style of game, and the music fits that as well. How did you sort of draw that um, sonic inspiration? To, I know you said you just sort of sit down and see what happens, but you must have sort of yeah. been seeing what happens, but with a a goal in mind to some degree, right? True. Well, I mean, it's a lot of it is just gut feeling, you know, it's like kind of intuition. Um, I think uh, with Stardew Valley, you know, if you hear some of the really like old tracks that I didn't even use, they mm. sound even more video gamey. They sound like very, like I was like literally trying to use the exact like method that you would for super nintendo because i wanted it to sound like super nintendo oh, interesting um now yeah so i was I, trying to stay stay okay go ahead i'm yeah. gonna say can i can i maybe uh, ask and slash put you on the spot do you, you don't happen to have any of that early stuff that we could pop up do you uh i could check yeah i mean i have I, oh, don't I don't, have don't worry stuff. about it as a, as a top priority i just just i'm gonna kind of put a mental pin in that maybe when we actually pop open some sessions we could sure, check some sure. Of that if it's yeah good. i think i i could have some some stuff cool. um but yeah, like I, I was like trying to make it sound really like Super Nintendo. Like, so I think this is often what happens too. It's like when I try to constrain myself, I'll stick to it for a while. And then there'll be a moment where I'm like, oh man, I could make this sound better if I just added this thing that 
breaks the rules, right? Mm, right. So then, then I'll end up just doing it because it's it's annoying, you know. <laughs> so it's like uh, I think that's what happened with with Stardew Valley. Is like I started, I was trying to make it sound just like Super Nintendo. Then I I was like, man, I could make this sound way better if I just use these effects or if I added this other thing. And then eventually, I kind of got to the what ended up being the Stardew Valley soundtrack, which there's actually all kinds of effects. It doesn't conform to any sort of, you know, retro gaming uh, standard or anything. Right. But... And so it's, it's, and maybe that is sort of its charm is that it is um, reminiscent without being just sort of parroting that stuff. You yeah. Know? It, you, yeah. You, you sort yeah. of get that vibe, but it, but it definitely does feel new. That makes, uh, that does make sense. Uh, we've got some people in the comments, Jesse saying, yes, please early Stardew music. So, okay. We have to, <laughs> we'll have to remember to, <laughs> to look okay. for that stuff. Um, so, uh, one last thing, and then we'll, we probably should jump into actually looking at some of this stuff, but, um, there's something that I am fascinated by with your story. And I think other people would take a lot of inspiration from, which is you worked on this for years and you worked on this as a solo guy for years and when I think about that process and I think about, I can, um, I can imagine you getting started and I can imagine you six months in I can imagine you a year and a half in. But once I start getting to thinking about you and you're three years in, the thing that comes up to me is that you must have had so much audacity to be pushing forward with this. The, the amount of self-belief that you have that you would have to push against the like, what am I doing? Oh my God, this is taking forever. Why am I doing this? You know, like I'm spending all my evenings working on this, you know, and is it my weekends? Is it worth it? What am I giving up to, to do this? And so where does that, where does that come from? That drive to keep going on in the fourth year, you know, when you're, I feel like you're getting close, but not quite, you know? Well, it's just, uh, you know, I've always had a very strong drive to succeed and to, you know, have people appreciate my art. That's always something I wanted very much. In fact, I was, it was what my life was about. It's what I desperately wanted in my life. So I did what it took to make that happen. I mean, I, I adopted a mindset of, I will never give up no matter what. Mm. It doesn't matter. If the Stardew Valley failed, I'm going to make another game. I'm going to learn what I you know, I'm going to take what I learned. I'm going to make an even better game. If that doesn't work, I'm going to make another game. I will never give up. You know, right. you kind of, I feel like to, to, to make a, an indie game, especially by yourself, you kind of have to have some of that. You have to, even if you doubt yourself inside, you have to convince yourself that you are absolutely going to be a success. 100% faith, you know, right. That's what, that's, that was my approach. 100% faith, 110% faith. Right. Like you just have to, there, there's like, it's do or die. You have to do it. It makes it's like a, total sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially when I was three years into it, I had already invested three years into this thing. I wasn't going to give up, you know, that would have been three years of my life, you know, just washed down the drain. Well, and I had been, I had told everyone <laughs> I'm going to make this game. This game's going to be big. It's going to be a success, you know, like, so if I let them down, uh, that would be embarrassing. So there's like social pressure that I think subconsciously I created for myself in order to uh, give me more incentive to finish this and make it good. Was that a conscious thing you did at the outset or was that something that just happened as a byproduct of you're just a social guy and you mentioned to people that you were doing it and then felt that? Uh, I'm not that social of a guy. So <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call myself a social guy, but um, I think it, it was subconscious. I would say, I think it was okay. probably subconscious. And if I think about it, probably even me announcing haunted chocolatier, right is a way of lighting a fire underneath myself. It's like, now everyone knows about it. I, I can't back down now. I have to finish this game. I have to make it fantastic. You know, it yeah. has to be one of the greatest games ever or well, else people will be disappointed. I, so. I asked that question of, was it conscious? Because that is actually a very tried and true technique that people are taught to. When you have one of these sort of audacious dreams in life, they tell you, tell people, you know, if you want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, Tell people, you know, hey, you know, um, next year I'm going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro because if you keep it inside and you don't mention it, you might not be, you know, you're only letting yourself down and you're actually probably the often, you know, the easiest person to let things slide on yourself because you can rationalize that. Well, it wasn't a good year and I really actually there was that big project for work, so I didn't I'm not going to get ready in time, you know, and you can kind of let that go. But the minute you tell someone the thought, it's almost like the 
suddenly you're accountable to their judgment. You know, if the, you, you bump into them next year and they go, hey, did, how did you do Kilimanjaro? How was that? And you go, no, I had a work project. Yeah. So I put it off. You know, you like, feel like a dope. Yeah, you feel like a dope. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so so they tell you, they say, tell people because it will actually cause you to be um, more uh, more stick to it. I've, I've heard that too, but I didn't. I didn't know that. I don't, I like, didn't know that. I didn't do that consciously. It's like, I never read anything about like how to be successful or how to make a game or anything. It's just kind of like, I feel like it makes sense to me that people give that advice because I feel like I independently derived the same thing. You know, it's yeah. like, it's just, uh, it just makes sense. That's why I did it. And that's why people give it as advice too. You, uh, I mean, I, you know, at, at the risk of being overly complimentary, you do seem like you just kind of the, your first swing at the bat on all these things are just these like home runs, you know, it's like, Oh, I'll just, um, I'll, I'll put out this game. It's like, home run. I'll, uh, you know, well, <laughs> to be honest, like, <laughs> even though I was like saying, you know, 110% faith, I didn't think Stardew Valley was going to be that popular. I thought it would be popular with a niche audience, like okay. people who were fans of harvest moon. Right. Uh, I had no idea. So why do you think it that was is? a what shock do, to me? Do you have, you've obviously had years now, a few years to think about what the hell caused it to kind of catch fire. Do you have any insights into what did make it go massive? Well, you know, I don't know for sure. I think that maybe it was the right game at the right time. Um, and I think, you know, I did a good job with the game. It was a good game, but it was also the right game at the right time. Right. I think, uh, there was a growing number of people who were, you know, maybe interested in a game that wasn't so like, you know, intensely skill based, uh, like competitive or whatever. Stardew Valley is more relaxing. Um, go at your own pace. Right. It's, uh, I think, appealing to a, a, maybe a, a wider audience than just like the core, like traditional what you would think of as a gamer. But it appeals to a lot of people who aren't who didn't normally play games right at the time when, you know, maybe more people like that were interested in maybe playing a game, if there was a game for them, because games are the, you know, biggest form of entertainment now, right. You know, bigger than anything. So it's like everyone plays games, but there's not that many games for, you know, or at least there, I think there are now, but maybe when Stardew Valley came out, there weren't that many games that were kind of like appealing to everyone. Yeah. You know, even grandma. It's like I, I know a lot of grandmas like Stardew Valley. So it's like, it, you know, <laughs> right. ev everyone likes it. So I, I I guess it's maybe just kind of the pacing and the the feel of the game was more casual. And that was something that appealed to people that, or, makes, that people were ready for it. You know, that makes total sense. That makes total sense. I'm keeping an eye on the comments here. Uh, a, a user by the name of some guy points out the cynical um a rebuttal to what we were just talking about. He says, when you're used to disappointing yourself, it's a lot easier to disappoint other people. All right. Well, so maybe that's, uh, maybe that's, maybe that's well, the uh, corollary. Uh, ancillary you do have that. to have a certain amount of confidence or like, yeah. you know, I, I think I, I was always a person of the mindset that like, you know, I know that I have like a great artistic vision, but like, I never thought I would, it would be appreciated. Right. But like, I, I felt like I was very confident in myself that, I had a, a special vision. Mm, mm. Um, it's a, and I thought like realistically, like, yeah, I mean, probably that I'll never be appreciated. Like no one's going to care. Like, cause I, I had spent years like making like albums of music and just releasing them online with yeah. like, no one would listen to it except my friends, you know? Right. Right. But I do think you, you, what you just said there is actually really does hit upon it is that I think in any creative endeavor, if you can accurately convey the passion and the joy that you had in the creative process, if you can actually sort of capture that and hold it until the final product, it resonates with people and they pick up on it as well. There's an example that I often think of myself when I listen to uh, any music by Beastie Boys. I listen to that and, you know, th th you could say a lot about the production, but the thing that, uh, that still blows my mind is... When I listen to the final record, I can hear the fun that they're having in the studio when they made it. And the recording process, for anyone that's been through the recording process or music production process, you know that there's 10,018 opportunities to crush the joy out of the music making. You're obsessing over the sound of the recording. You're obsessing over the timing, the performance, the mix. Is it good enough? Is this balanced right? You know, should I change this part? And with all of that production work, you often do sort of like distill away 
the fun that got you into it in the first place. And they didn't. Somehow they managed, to, by the time you're listening to the final two-track master, you still hear them fucking around in the studio and making yeah. each other laugh, yeah. you know? I, and, I think uh, part, part of that is, like, not caring too much about... Uh, not caring too much about like uh, having mainstream success, I guess. And it's kind of like with Stardew Valley, like I wasn't thinking like this was going to be a big wide, you know, widespread game that everyone's going to like. I was kind of just making it for the joy of Harvest Moon and like the, the games that I, I right. loved. And I think, I think there's a, if you're trying to like make the most marketable product, um, I think often that can sap the joy out of it. So you kind of just have to stay true to yourself and make what you love. Right. And uh, that's, I think, what will ultimately be more profitable. I think, and that, that's advice that I'll give to people sometimes is like, if you like, don't stop thinking about making money, you know, just if, if you stop worrying about making money, then the money will come to you, right? It's like when you're trying to, to make money, when you're trying to chase the dollar, then it won't come to you. Right. I think that that's kind of how it works because you have to make something that's like unique and special and authentic and people can detect that if something is um, authentic and has passion. That makes it. total sense. There was a, a artist I spoke to. I can't remember who it was now, but um, there's this concept for bands. It's very true. Artists in the music world. Very true. There's this phrase called the sophomore slump, which is, your second record. It's if you have a big hit first record, your second record is almost guaranteed by the laws of the universe and Murphy's law to be a far less popular, probably critically trashed album. <laughs> and so as a band, if when you do have that first record, everyone sort of goes like, "Uh oh, we got to make another one. And we're going to have the sophomore slump. So I was talking to an artist about the concept of the sophomore slump and why that is. And the common wisdom tends to be that, if you're a band and you've been like kind of bashing it out in the garage, you work up enough songs over the course of six years to record your first album. It's six years of work. It's your best songs of six years. And of course that first album is going to be great. And then suddenly you only have like a year to make your follow up and it's, you, you, it's just not as good. But what this artist said was it's not that he thinks that the sophomore slump is actually caused by what you're talking about self-awareness that you, you your first album hits and but when your first album was made it was you were making what was meaningful to you you what you wanted to make and that second album now you're you're sort of infected with the thoughts of the audience what are they going to think of this and oh the industry said that we are a this type of genre we're pioneering this sound and now we have to live up to that expectation and you're self-aware and you're you're almost trying to imitate the opinion that others have of you rather than be true to yourself. And that, and that is destined to fail when you try and do that, you know? Absolutely. I, I can, I, I completely agree. And I can relate to some degree with, uh, you know, working on haunted chocolatier, mm, of course. which is a game that's very much in Stardew Valley's shadow at this point and will be compared to it. And, uh, <laughs> the sophomore slump. Like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the same thing could hold true in uh, video games, especially from solo devs, like, you know, myself, uh, it's like, I, you know, it, it's, it's difficult because I, I can't help but think about Stardew Valley when I'm making this game and I, I'm, I'll, it'll be, it'll come, it'll manifest or like in ways like, you know, oh, I can't do this. It's too much like Stardew Valley, but then it's like a lot of the things in Stardew Valley are the way they are because it just makes sense. It would be, it would be foolish to do it any other way. Right. Right. So it's kind of like, I don't know. I lately I've just kind of been like, you know what? screw it. I'm just going to, even if it's, if I do a thing that's just like Stardew Valley, if it makes sense, it makes sense. I'm not going to worry about it too much. Right. Like I just got to make the game the best game I possibly can. If that means that a lot of stuff in Stardew Valley was perfect and it doesn't need to be changed. Right. Then I'm just going to do it the same way and not worry about it. If people say it's cut and paste Stardew Valley, well, so be it. I mean, what did you expect? You expected to make a sports game or a racing game? Right. I mean, right. this is just what I do. That makes, um, and, and I, you know, I think in, that's a really healthy attitude and probably, yeah. I mean, the, the fans, I, 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 when I think about bands that I've loved growing up, you get that first album, you go like, whoa, these guys are really good. I don't know. I'm going to pick one off the top of my head, but like, you know, uh, Rage Against the Machine, first album comes out and it's like, holy shit, what is this? You know, I don't think anyone would have been upset if a second album came out that was just as good and doing this, hitting the same notes as, uh, as at that album, you know? 
And so you're right. It, it's sort of, that sounds like a really healthy way just to say like, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and avoid myself. I'm not going to try and sidestep my own instincts because those instincts are, well, it actually reminds me, I had a, a, a teacher in high school who used to have all these little like life advice things he would say to his students. And one of them was something like, I'm paraphrasing it badly, but it was something like, whatever brought you here, do that. And it's like, don't, once you, once you arrive at a place, don't second guess how you got there. Just keep doing what you're doing. So I think you're, you're onto yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, as someone, you know, who listens to music and follows bands and stuff, it's like, uh, I often, if I like a band, I'm like disappointed when they make another album and it sounds different. Yeah. It's like, I just want more of the same, you know, right. Right. <laughs> just make like, I, I like those 10 songs on that album just make another 10 songs do it that, again. that's great and i felt <laughs> i felt that about that's why i made stardew valley because i felt that about the early harvest moon games that i loved i was like i wish they'd just keep making these over and over again just right you can have new characters a new world whatever i would like that for the rest of my life instead they kind of started doing different stuff and then right. that's when i like uh you know decided i need to just kind of do what i wish they had done myself because they aren't doing it anymore so i have to do it right right um, well should we should we actually we're, we're talking in the abstract should we talk in the practical and uh, take a look at some some of the music yeah, from stardew yeah, valley cool so i'm gonna um swap over here and have you uh go ahead and share your screen okay and i'm going to uh i've been flagging a couple of comments um that have been going by while we've been talking uh, let me just see if there's any uh, to bring up here. I'm going to revisit some of these as we go. We'll do a little Q&A part. Um, oh, yeah, somebody, this is actually just, I'll ask you right off the bat. Somebody asked, um, who's your favorite Stardew Valley character, your own personal favorite Stardew Valley character? <laughs> I can't really answer that because I feel like if I did, it would cause a rift in the entire Stardew Valley <laughs> community. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. I, and also, it's like they're all my children. I'm not going to say publicly that one's my favorite, right? You might have a favorite, but you're not going to say it. That's right. That's right. I had a friend whose grandmother actually used to do that, and it totally messed up the family. She would pull aside one of the grandkids, and she'd go, now you're my favorite, but don't tell anyone else. <laughs> and then when the kids all kind of grew up, one of them finally said, like, you know, I, I feel guilty saying this, but, you know, grandma used to say I was her favorite, but she wouldn't let me tell anyone. And then they all went, she told me that, too. Like, so she apparently, like, oh, wow. that was her, <laughs> her M.O. <laughs> so yeah, good, yeah. Good, that you, good that you don't play favorites, even secretly, because it, it <laughs> causes rifts with the, with the kids. Well, so now we are looking at uh, here. I'm going to move myself a little bit out of the way. I got to resize myself. Let's see here. I'll drop me down here. Um, we are looking at something familiar to any reason user who's on this stream, but anybody who's not a reason user, um, what we're looking at here is the music software that Eric, uh, did the music for Stardew Valley in. And it's, um, not unlike other music software in that you tend to have what I'm just going to describe them for Eric, just so people kind of see what's going on yeah, here. No problem. You've got these, uh, horizontal color coded tracks and basically the music and the score of the game, um, is, happening on those tracks so one instrument per row basically so there's something uh on the green row something you know different instruments down on the that sort of beige row and uh, we're going to just be kind of poking into how this works so what do we what do we have pulled up here eric to start with so this is the uh the song is called cloud country it's the song that plays when you create your character should i just play a little bit of it yeah let's go and let's hear a little bit Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, I realized someone just pointed out correctly that I've got the wrong name on the. There we go. Okay. Uh, fix it up. We I I put the uh, wrong overlay name. You were Jeff Gibbons for a little while there while you were playing that uh, music. Oh. So. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so that 
I mean, I, I, I love that. And it's obviously, you know, um, anyone who hears that would be like, oh, clearly this is a, a, a kid that would listen to metal. That's, that's how you arrive at that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's uh, such, I mean, the, the thing I hear about Stardew Valley is that it puts that you are in this mood, the sort of, it's got this very pacifying sort of quality to, it's just a game you can sit and play. And, and the music is something that I think probably contributes to that. Uh, very much this must be something you made what 10 years ago or so uh probably yeah That's... i mean maybe a little less than 10 years because with the as with everything in stardew i kind of like redid stuff over and over again okay um but i think this was one of the earlier songs that i made so yeah it could be almost 10 years old at this point i gotcha i gotcha um let me just uh do a quick yeah, so... adjustment here i'm gonna we'll turn that off there we go okay um one I, thing, like in all my reason files, you'll you'll see there's like often over to the right, like beyond where the song yes. is, there's like secret stuff that I didn't use. Like I don't even know what this is, but oh, cool, let's check it out. It sounds like crap, you know. Like I don't even. It sounds like garbage. I don't even know what that so is. Just sort of but, yeah, thoughts thoughts for later or things that yeah. didn't work out. I have so sometimes the, there's actually good stuff over there that right. I, you know when I when I to prepare for this, I was like listening to some of the old or bringing up the old song files and I found some stuff off to the side and I was like, man, this actually sounds pretty good. Does any of that stuff maybe even find its way into... Oh. Yeah, I don't That's know. cool. Yeah, some, it might make... Some of the stuff might uh, find its way into something. That is Definitely. cool. That is really cool. I So in the editing world, uh, in the video editing, uh, my first ever documentary project, um, my production partner and I who were editing and working on that together, we came up with this term for that area that we use. It's just our internal jargon. We refer to it as Pete's graveyard. And it's because we were, <laughs> we were working with a band. The band was called the bouncing souls and their uh, guitarist Pete. We had just a gazillion clips of Pete saying various things in his interview. And we didn't quite know where to put them. So we'd throw them off to the side. And then when we'd kind of get stuck in the narrative while we were editing, we're like, well, what, what, what do we have over in Pete's graveyard? Is there anything in Pete's graveyard? And then for, that was 2001. And to this day, I still have stuff off to the side that is, you know, that's Pete's graveyard. That's just where I go to kind of grab that <laughs> stuff. So I'm glad to see that you use the same. You, uh, you worked with technique. the Bouncing Souls? Yeah, I did, a, cool. did a documentary nice. with them uh, back in 2003. Cool. Um, so. Um, yeah, yeah, like uh, I definitely will probably use a lot of this stuff i mean i don't know if you agree with this but i feel like you know a lot of musicians do their best work when they're like in their early 20s yeah uh, it feels like like <clears throat> i feel like with music um and it's not always the case and i i'm i don't think it's the case with me but sometimes you know as you get older your ability starts to decline like quicker i think than a lot of other mediums mm. So I, I was even conscious of this when I was in my early 20s. So I try to make as much music as I possibly could in that time of my life so wow. that I could later go back and like grab stuff, you know? <laughs> you know, I would, I as a, as someone who is not in their early 20s, I would love to push back on you and go, oh, that's not true. You're very, uh, very viable in later on. But I actually think you're probably correct. It's sad to- Well, I, to... I think there's a there's a certain element of like, you have the raw musical talent, which right. maybe peaks in your early 20s, but then there's a certain maturity factor and uh, right. knowledge and experience. So it's like the one thing is kind of maybe going like this, but then the other thing kind of is going like this. So there might be like a way that, you know, for a long time, you can kind of still make good stuff by balancing it out. And I still think in some ways I'm making better music now than I was in my early 20s because it was I had a ton of raw like ideas but sure. it was like almost unfocused you know now right. i know better how to focus it and actually make a viable song out of song oh that's interesting that's interesting yeah well let's so can we just kind of pop in and look a little bit at this tune here i am what i'm seeing first of all is um a very um let me just actually make this a little bigger i'm seeing a lot of an instrument and again i'm going to be speaking a little bit to the uh, audience that may not be Reason users, I'm seeing a lot of this one instrument we have in Reason called the NNXT, which is a sampler. It takes sampled instruments, uh, real life instruments, you know, often, and will sort of recreate them in a in a virtual instrument. I'm seeing you use a lot of that. Uh, clearly, you were drawn to that instrument. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, NNXT, as you say, because it's a sampler and it samples real life instruments, it sounds 
kind of realistic. It sounds organic. It doesn't sound necessarily like electronic music. And with Stardew Valley, which is a game about being a farmer, being, you know, you're in nature. Yeah. Um, it just kind of was intuitive to me that that would be more appropriate. Mm. So I, you'll see in all the Stardew Valley songs, like I use this like crazy. I use the NNXT. It's like my primary thing. And I, honestly, with reason, like I mostly just use the default reason sound banks for all my music. Like I'm not like a huge, like, you know, experimental producer kind of guy. I'm more, I, I'm more like a composer than a producer, I would say. Um, so I'll often just use like the default reason sound banks for all the uh, instruments. Like, right. I think everything here is just uh, straight up like basic old school reason and nxt it, it really like is it really is old school reason you know people in the comments are noticing as well that you know it's got the uh the old was it the 14.2 mixer you know the but you know oh yeah and in fact you know i don't i you may still use reason like this when you when you work in it but you know reason in version was it, six or seven you know we added this big big mixer on top and you can sort of build songs in a different way but when i look at your rack here I'm seeing like, it's very clear to me, like you got started on this project probably around reason 4.0. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Yeah. I mean the, I have like reason, I think whatever the latest thing is now yeah. I have that. And right. It, I've noticed it is a bit different. Like this mixer here doesn't just pop up. I think it used to just pop up like by default. So. I think the default, yeah. The default song had one of those ready to go. Yeah. yeah so that's kind of just what I was used to, but right. Um. Yeah. I mean, NXT, I, I, I still use it all the time. There's obviously like in the newer versions of reason, there's some cool stuff. And I might pull up a song that I, I pulled up the song the other day and I was like, Oh, I must've like had just up like upgraded reason right before I made this song because it has like, it's using all of these, like uh, whatever the percussion we'll, we'll see later. Yeah, okay, but okay, like, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah, well, so um, to, to, to talk a little bit about this, the notion of samplers, I wonder if we could just kind of poke into a couple of these, the, um, the first one, the one that jumps out to me, and I'm going to, um, I have to uh, uh, announce my bias is the banjo. Um, the, the idea that you went, I think you are correct, your creative instinct to go for sort of real organic sounds in a game that's literally about organic material, uh, makes total sense. And, and, and banjo particularly, you know, being sort of an instrument that came out of rural Appalachia, um, I think it was a, an interesting choice. Could we maybe solo um, the the banjo or just hear a yeah. little bit of that banjo? Yeah, absolutely. Huh. <laughs> I mean, it's great, you know. Ryan, I, I heard that you're a banjo player yourself. I am a banjo player. So when Eric and I were talking uh, earlier last week, uh, getting set up for this, he said something to me. He said, I mentioned I was a banjo player to you. And, and Eric said to me, uh, oh, you'll have to let me know how I did at sort of faking a banjo. And, um, and I, I actually, I'm going to grab my banjo here for a second. I actually figured out how to play it on banjo. And I can tell you that... You're doing an actually rather respectable job. Um, it's a different style of banjo than bluegrass banjo or or even sort of um, Appalachian old time banjo, which is a style called claw hammer. This is um, the way you're playing it. The banjo is uh, more of a style called uh, plectrum banjo, which is sort of the stuff that comes out of uh, you get it. In, I mean sort of Irish folk music and stuff. And it's, it's a four string banjo rather than a five string banjo. I won't turn this into a symposium on the banjo, but I did, um, I did work out the part and let's see if I can remember how it goes. Um, oh wait, let me, I'll turn off my noise gate. Yeah. Okay. Wait, no. So nice. it, it is entirely uh, doable to to translate that over to banjo, and uh, and it works. And you know the thing is, is like I mean my my slightly janky playing aside, that sample actually does a pretty good job of representing. I mean, it sounds like a banjo. So and I've heard people get it way worse when they when they write banjo parts using samples. So whatever you did, you got it right. How how did you get? Were you you were translating? I guess your guitar knowledge into. 
yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, yeah, as I mentioned, I was a, I am a guitar player, so it's, I kind of like, I guess again, just intuition. I wasn't really thinking about it too much, except I wanted it to sound natural and uh, organic. So yeah. Um, well, it, it 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 works and it does. You know, it, it's a total. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it that part good. is a kind of. Like, and so and now, but, in terms of just the sound design stuff, so you're putting that banjo patch that comes out of the factory sound bag, and then you've just added just sort of a basic reverb under it just to give it a little space, right? Yeah. Yep, just to make it sound. Not decent. even that much, just a little bit. Let's, of let's see what it would sound like without the reverb. I'm just curious. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, I guess that it God, just kind funny. of... It, you yeah. When you turn that off, well, suddenly it's like, this isn't Stardew Valley. And you turn it on, it's like, hey, Stardew Valley. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this uh, particular part of the game, it's kind of like a, a very open moment. You, you're like in the clouds when you're creating your character. So it right. needed to be big. You know? Right. Um, so let's see, what else is yeah going on there? You've got, is that like so an like, ocarina like, or something? or? Oh, so this is... Uh, this, let's see, an NXT3 here. That's the pan flute. Oh, pan flute. I use that okay. like crazy. Wait, that's not the pan flute, is it? That sounds like voice puff. Yeah, voice puff. That's like <laughs> a... I For some reason, I love voice puff. I <laughs> I use it like all over the place. Really? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Voice puff. And that's in the, that's in the factory sound bank. So folks, uh, reason users out there, Go forth and uh, make some music with voice puff. I would almost love, I mean, I, I not to turn it into an official challenge, but people can see the patches you've got here. Pan flute, voice puff, uh, there's banjo. I mean, I'd love to hear if anybody Red wants bass. to make their own interpretation of uh, Stardew Valley style music using the actual patches. I mean, I'll, I'll just throw that out to the Reason community. If anybody does something, um, put it out on socials and, and add us with it and it'd oh be yeah kind of... i would i'd be interested to hear that myself wouldn't that be neat yeah just take the same ingredients but a different chef and see what they can kind of cook up with that here's a pan flute it's like it sounds almost weird like uh, i don't even like you don't even hear that part when you listen to the song i was but... gonna say i don't recognize it yeah wow But if you were to now, if you were to mute that, I bet you you would feel its absence like crazy. It, yeah, it might just be a, sound a little thin, you know. Yeah. It sounds okay, but it's missing a certain. Uh, it's the mood. It's the something. like the emotion of that part. Yeah, and so another thing about like you know video game music is that uh, often it has to loop well. That's something that I think, I, I don't know if, you know, other producers that you have on here who are making, you know, just like electronic dance music or whatever. Right. That's probably not a concern, really. You're making one song and it might fade out at the end or whatever. But right. Yeah. Often with video game music, it has to be able to loop and it has to work, you know, like it has to somehow and I don't it, know. There's like a, a certain skill to it, I guess. What I think is the skill that is really interesting to me is that it's one thing to make something loop. Like, I mean, a lot of people make loop based music. And so it's one thing to make something that you can sort of loop, but it's another thing to make something. I mean, I'm looking at this here. You're at the end of the song and you're at a minute and eight seconds. And people, when they listen to this, they're not listening to it for a minute and eight seconds. In fact, this particular song, I know when you go on YouTube and search for it, there's people that have strung it out into, you know, the, the, the three hour YouTube clip version of it, you know? Yeah. It, it's quite a skill to make something that is so short and yet doesn't wear on you with repetition, you know? Right. One thing I want to just mention just for people who aren't familiar with, you know, music production, because you were saying like uh, um, that it's a sampler. I feel like when people hear that, they might think that that means like it's uh, the oh. entire thing is pre-done. But what this means in the context here is that like it's literally just someone took a banjo and recorded every single note. Right. right. So like, wait, that's not the banjo. Like. 
Right. This is such an right, excellent, so someone, that's such a great point to clear up for people. It's not that you're using pre-recorded banjo lines and just arranging right. them like, like a magnetic poetry kit. You, you're, no, so it's like someone recorded those notes, and then when I press the key, you know, it like, it plays that <laughs> note. So it's like, you know, you can create music with that, and that's what this literally is. Like, I lay out these notes. You know, the people who are Reason users, they know all this, but like some of the people who are watching who are just Stardew Valley fans or whatever, they might not understand that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that is a, that's an excellent point to, to point out that you, the, what you're loading is the sound of the banjo, and then it, you're bringing everything else to the table. The notes that are being played, the melody, the hooks, the, the, the chords, all that stuff is, is what you're actually creating with that sort of raw, like a seed of a sound rather than um, the sound itself. That's a, that's Another a thing that might be somewhat interesting to the Reason users is like, I, I know a lot of people have like keyboards and all kinds of like equipment around them. Um, but like, I don't, I don't use any of that. Like I literally use the, the keyboard, like the, that I type on. Wait, you're saying, like, you're saying, hang on. I gotta, I don't I gotta, have a MIDI keyboard. I gotta <laughs> sort of take this one in because I, I think I'm in love with this. You're saying that you made the soundtrack for Stardew Valley in Reason using factory sounds and the computer qwerty keyboard to yes type. <laughs> absolutely yeah i don't I, know, I did not have a midi keyboard or anything like that and in fact i usually just lay down notes like you know i just lay it down on the piano roll you know with my mouse i i love that because you know there is there is so much when when someone is feeling resistance into getting into doing music one of the major things and listen i am guilty of it myself in fact i'm going to go back to my main view i am surrounded by my insecurities of <laughs> like uh, i can't make music unless i have this big keyboard and and i can't possibly sound good unless i have this outboard gear next to me you know and it the ability to do without down to the point of not even having just being like oh you know i mean there's a reason that the developers a reason put that qwerty type you know keyboard in so that you could just use your laptop keyboard and play notes i mean it, it's a viable way to do it and i love that you actually did make the soundtrack that way that just blows my mind <laughs> james hutching says qwerty for the win yeah man in fact actually i'm gonna throw this out to the audience if you are someone who works on a full-size keyboard or, you know, like an actual sort of piano MIDI keyboard when you make music, you make different music. when you, And I've done it. If I've been on an airplane or something and I want to just, like, work in reason, I'll use the, the QWERTY keyboard. And you write differently. You write different things. And so if you haven't done that, by all means, uh, this is going back to the first thing we even talked about. Impose that limitation on yourself because it will, it will create something absolutely uh, worthwhile. So, um, so maybe let's pull up a more like complicated. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. Song, yeah. Like one of the, one of the classics. Oh, I, well, whatever. So now Eric, while you do that, I'm going to just kind of scan around for some comments because you have, um, okay. we're going to need to drop that. Uh, Eric and I are using this, uh, audio streaming plugin to get his uh, audio over to me. So if you could yeah. kind of set that up, Okay. I'm just going to kind of talk to the, the crowd here and just see what they got going on here. Um, you know, Hollow Sounds, for example, he's saying, uh, I have too many keyboards, but I still just click the notes in with a mouse for over 15 years. Totally, a totally good way to do it. I mean, you know, like whatever works for you, I think is the, the way to do it for sure. Um, Maya Eden says, as a music student, she, she loves this. It can be so intimidating to try music, but it doesn't have to be scary or complicated. 100% true, Maya. I mean, I think... There are a lot of things, and I've seen it in other people, and I, I felt it myself when I got started making music, that it can be a little daunting, but that daunting feeling, once it, it's, it's almost the, the irony of it is that once you're far enough into making music, you realize that you needn't have felt daunting in the first place. And you sort of wish, you know, you could like, if there was a time machine, you could leave yourself a little post-it note on the mirror, you know, four years earlier going, Hey, uh, this is future Ryan. It don't, don't be put off. It's just, just try, just, you know, go for it and you'll love it. So I think that's absolutely true. Um, let's see what else is going on in the comment. Um, Anna Mailer says, love the moonlight jellies music. Okay. Um, Oh, here, this is just for the Reason crowd. QWERTY Keyboard Plus Players. This is, Eric, that's a new f a feature that if you're still in the, the Reason 4 and 5 mindset, I gotta, I'll have to 
turn you on to players. You'll love them. Um, but um, let's see. Uh, in high school, the Muggy Buggy. In high school, I used to write music with my QWERTY keyboard. I still play, but don't write anymore. Oh, we'll get, get, now's a good time as ever to get back into it. All right, Eric. So I see you've got it up on your screen there. Do you have... Um, Oh, there's a, probably a, a link waiting for me in the chat, isn't there? Let me click on that. Yeah. And let me click start listening. Okay, great. So we should be good to go now. Let me just yeah. pull that up on my screen with you. Okay, so what are so, we... So this at? is one of the season songs, which is uh, just more... In Stardew Valley, they're always like more complicated, I guess. All the more complicated songs are all the season songs. Uh, this one's from Summer. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun you to be have, able to... You have such a... Your sense of melody is so strong that you... that You <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it, it, writing, writing a catchy melody, I often talk to people in the Reason community, you know, every now and again, people will sort of make some disparaging comments about pop music. Oh, it's, it's so easy. And it's like, is it though? Is it so easy? Like, try and make pop music and come back and tell me how easy it is because it's actually... To make something that is so accessible and earwormy, it's actually quite difficult. And and you've got definitely the knack for it. I mean, the, the melodies are so strong in this. True. Melodies are very important. They've got to be good. And I've, I've heard a lot of music where, like, the the production is all good and everything, but then the melody comes in and it's like, what is this? <laughs> what even is this, you know? Right, uh, right. That, that happens too often, I think. But There's a, a comment here. Um Every summer morning becomes amazing thanks to this song. <laughs> so oh, yeah, yeah. Well, hold on. we got to get to the... Here comes the pan flute. Oh, cool. <laughs> got the little bend stem yep, here. Yep, yep. vibraphone oh yeah so if i like removed all the effects oh my gosh you're saying this arpeggio yeah and in fact you've actually dialed up hang on a minute just so people really understand this um pause for a second let's play that again um but go back to the the nnxt for that because what i noticed is it's a vibraphone which is for people that may not know it's a traditional orchestral instrument it's the big looks sort of like a um, well, like a marimba, but maybe you don't know that either. But it's a, a, a sort of like a bunch of piano keys, but they're made out of these um, aluminum. I think they're or maybe they're steel, but these like long bars of metal, and you and you hit them with a mallet, and they have a really unique sound. But what you've done here is you've actually dialed the attack knob way up, so that you actually lose the sound of the mallet hitting the the bar, you know, it sort of, it fades in. Every single note just sort of woo, 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 has a little fade to it. Can you play the part with yeah. it, with it, with the attack as it is? And now dial that to what it would normally be. Actually sounds kind of cool. It does sound cool. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I, I wanted it to be very ethereal at this part. Yeah. But, but that's this such is, a neat, see, it, that's such a this great is like thing. a yeah. You, normally, I was saying like you know I'm often like not much of a producer, but it's like cases like this. You know, you got to be a little bit. You got to because if I turned all the effects off and turn the attack down, then it's like here's what it sounds like. Right. So if I just like drop the vibraphone in and used it as is, yeah, it loses everything. And it you have to have at that moment. I think that's where this, you know, what I was talking with with one of the commenters about this idea of being daunted. 
it can be daunting if you don't know. When you first loaded up that vibraphone sound, you had to sort of go, okay, this isn't awesome right now, but with a few creative choices, I can make this awesome. And you may not have known what those creative choices would be, but you just had faith, I guess, or just the Well, experience? call it intuition. intuition so it's like, yeah. I, I think often what happens is like, you know, I, I've got, I got to hear, and then I just know, okay, like what, where am I going from here? I probably first, uh, I would imagine, like, I just knew that, like, I knew that it should do that. And I probably had the baseline. And then I was thinking this needs something, right? So yeah. it's like, I probably just had the intuition that like, some kind of ethereal backing would it was just like what i wanted where i wanted to go with the song right like some kind of ethereal background right. thing and then i i kind of i'm just a fan of arpeggios in general so i probably just thought like i need something that sounds kind of you know ethereal like this and then i probably i don't know how i actually came to using this vibraphone with the attack and everything but it's great and that you know yeah. as a advice to someone or maybe just to kind of make a, a teachable moment out of this sometimes adjusting one knob if you load up a, an instrument in reason if you are or you know or if you're just watching and you make music in some other program you load up a plugin sometimes just one knob can make all the difference in the way a sound sounds and there is no there's no rule against trying them you know i think sometimes people have a little bit of a uh, a fear almost of like, Oh, I can't, I don't know what that knob does. So I can't touch it. Say like, no, touch it, twist it, see what yeah. it does. Turn it up, turn it down. Yeah, you know, often too, just adding some like reverb to an instrument, you drop an instrument in, although with all the like new reason stuff, I feel like there's like often reverb, like already baked into the sometimes. Yeah. It's set, a, but... it's a very, uh, there's, there's very, um, passionate discussions over in the developer side of like, when do we do that? When do we give you the reverb and when do we deliberately not give you the reverb, you know? Um, and yeah, there's yeah, two, two schools of thought on that. Someone, I, I don't, I wonder how easy this is to do. Um, someone, we can maybe use this song as an example. They said, I would love to hear the Stardew music without any effects. How many tracks are here? If we were to just quickly bypass all the little red effects boxes. Yeah, we can do that. But hold on. First, I want to look at this. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. Do, 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 do. Sure. Yeah, huh? see, uh, I just want to talk about it. Let's listen to this. Oh, right yeah, now. yeah. Cool, cool. This right here. You hear that? It's like uh, I, I call those glitters, and I love using those. Like, Wow. They're just like I'll be listening to the, to the music. Like this would probably this is probably this thing down here is what I'm talking about. It's specifically this little. And NXT 12. Okay. Let's see what it is. Okay, so it's an electronic piano that I again got oh. rid of the or I turned the attack way down. I'm gonna know that. Yeah, so you've done the same that okay. same attack trick. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, when I say I call them glitters, they could be it could be anything. But usually, what they are is like I'll be listening to the music, and then there'll just be something where I like, at a certain moment, I'm like, you know, this would be nice if there was just a little something here in the background, like yeah. a just something so it's like i just it's often something like that that's kind of yeah it's like it didn't need that right. but it just adds a little extra delight to it you know that is that's amazing okay. i mean that that <laughs> that is I, I i i find it i'm not quite sure why i'm drawing so many parallels to um, all of the pop music producers that I have talked to, but there's one of those in there as well. There's a, there's an, a producer I knew that, uh, had a technique that he referred to as star Wars mixing. And what he meant was that he was like, you know, you've got your song going along and you spend all your time worrying about the melody and the lyrics and the chords and the drum beat and all that. But to, to really make it catchy and engaging throughout, he said, I, I, I often want to just put in these little things and you know and he said I, I i thought of star wars where you just you get a little laser firing off or you you know the lightsaber makes a noise when you swing it like there's just these little things that kind of capture your ear and i feel like that's he would call that a star wars mixing trick that you just did there where you have this thing that it is not fundamental to the 
if you took that away, the song stands on its own totally just fine. But you put it in, and it just kind of tickles the ear a little bit to keep. Yeah, it takes it to the next level. It's like it's something you might you might miss when you listen to it the first time, but maybe on your seventh listen, you kind of notice this little thing. You're kind of waiting for it. Fact, right, fact, right. It's like it's like ear candy, you know, those little bling bling bling, the little glitters. You, you know, it's like ear candy. You said that at exactly the same time that Jake uh, said it's. The ear candy, and he's totally right, and you're totally right. <laughs> Alice says glitters glitters should be a real musical term. So uh, maybe we can actually get that. Uh, <laughs> we'll make we'll make that a musical yeah, term. <laughs> in reason thirteen, you can. Uh, That's right. You we'll can have a new, that. new glitters feature. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I turned off all the effects. Let's oh, see did what you? It oh, okay. Like. Let's see how this goes. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds a little flat. Right. But it's still there, you know. It sounds more video gamey, I would it say. It does. God, it really does. I mean, you know, early consoles didn't have reverb, so. You know, the, the NES, the, the Super NES, and all those sort of chip-based things, even when they did, like, the, the SNES had sample-based music, but it didn't really have reverb. It had a, if I remember correctly, it sort of had a, like, a delay effect that you yeah, could you yeah. could crank up enough to kind of feel sort of like... It sounded kind of like reverb, but it was like, it was like kind of bad reverb, you know? Right. But it had a certain sound to it, which, in fact... I think I tried to emulate in some songs. I don't remember which. But. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, uh, so Audrey uh, comments. It's still a banger. I agree, Audrey. It is still it's still a great. I mean, that's the 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 truth of it is that, um, and this is true of all music production, effects are not going to turn a bad idea into a good idea. You know, you have to have a totally solid thing going, and I think that's what Eric does so well is that it's there are you know, hooks and melodies on top of hooks and melodies followed by new hooks and melodies. It's just nonstop with these sort of um, earworm kind of ear candy uh, lines. And so, yeah, you can make that feel more, um, you know, uh, spatial by adding reverb, but the the idea certainly still has to be there. So um, let's see what else is going on in the comments. Um Okay, and if there's any like particular songs or anything that people want to yeah. take a look at too, I'm fine with that. Cool. Okay. Um, oh, someone says uh, it sounds like something out of The Lion King. I would have never made that connection, but I I get it. <laughs> it's got you know there there is you know your the mood you're setting is there's a commonality with some of that sort of um, Disney Renaissance. I, I, I get era. it. It's kind of like the uh, I can't. I just can't wait to be king or something. Yes, it kinda yes. sounds like that. I guess. <laughs> Right, right. So yeah, um, throw out in the comments, guys, if there's uh, if there's another particular Stardew Valley song that we should pop up here and maybe kind of take a look at. Um, and while you do that, Eric, if I could um, just ask you a little bit about the percussion at the beginning of this one as well, because I think the percussion is really quite a nice little way to start this idea. Yeah, what is that? Where does that come? Is castanets and. Huh. So it says Tom Floor, but it's because I I don't. Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> you just dragged some samples onto a probably a modified another yeah. preset. It's um it's just a few. I mean it's just a few sounds. What is it? Four sounds maybe that are because you're not yeah. even using all those. Yeah, there you go. So it's five sounds: shakers and castanets. Huh. Yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of shakers and castanets. I use that a lot in the Stardew Valley soundtrack. So I'm seeing comments here. People are suggesting songs. I'm going to um, I'm going to open it up to you, I guess, maybe to to make the call on which one you might want to pull up. Um, some of them naturally, people are asking for uh, the winter theme, the fall theme, that kind of thing. Uh, Moonlight Jellies uh, was one that got recommended. Um, what else? Um, yeah, winter music, please again. Sure, I could do that. the winter. Maybe I'll do the uh, the wind can be still. That's kind of someone that uh, okay. I think a lot of people like, and it's a little bit different because it's oh, yeah. not 
in NXTs, it's more synth based. It's kind of like uh a... Okay. Cool. Yeah, why don't you pop that one up and you can get that uh link over to me and then yep. I will um, just kind of check in here with the comments while you do that. Just like, again, Briggs says, Factory Sound Bank for the win. Uh, I agree, Briggs. It's, uh, it's so fun. You know, as people who know Reason Factory Sound Bank sounds, it's always fun to see them out in the wild. In fact, I remember one time I was over in the Stockholm office when the first Tyler, the Creator album came out. And um, this guy who was working in our support department was just listening to it just as, you know, here's a new cool album. Everyone's buzzing about it. And then he heard a sound. He's like, wait a second. I know that sound. And he pulled it up. And sure enough, it was a reason sound. And then he started going through the album and like, you know, going, well, if, the, if there's one reason sound, I bet there's more. And, you know, after a few hours of hanging out, I guess, you know, not working on whatever else he was going to be working on, he was pulling out all these reason sounds and uh, just finding these factory sound bank sounds that made up that Tyler, the creator debut album. <laughs> Let me grab the link here uh, to get that going. I think, I mean, there's a lot of good sounds in the reason sound back. You, you could go your whole career and only use that. And I think you could make all kinds of interesting, compelling music. I mean, that's what I do. So, <laughs> right. I mean, I, I have, I, I have made some of my own like instruments that I use, but I don't think it's ne strictly necessary. Right. Right. That's uh that is true. And, you know, I, I have to remind myself of that sometimes when I'm feeling a little sort of creatively blocked or just kind of don't have it going on. And I sometimes I reach for the external kind of inspiration. And there's times I have to go, you know, I've been a reason user. I mean, I've been a reason user for 20 years and I still haven't ex found and explored everything that's in the factory sound bank. I mean, as much as you go running out to external sound libraries and stuff like, yeah, there is still stuff in there to, to be had. Um, Maya asks a question. I'm just going to throw it to you. Um, how long would it, would you say it takes to complete a full track that you're satisfied with? Um, well, it depends on like, you know, is it a kind of just a short song for an event or is it one of the season songs? The season songs might take me, if I'm really feeling inspired, it might take me one full day of work to do one of those. That's pretty good. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I but, mean, uh, one see, what, day. What would happen with Stardew Valley is like, you know, I made a lot of songs that just didn't make it, you know, they didn't make the cut. Yeah. And I would spend a whole day making a song and then it was like, you know, this just isn't good enough. Right. So there's. Yeah. But if you're doing, um, if you, uh, if you sort of have a, if it's a day to get a song, that's actually a fairly good. Um, well, for one thing, it's probably a good time constraint to say to yourself this i'm going to know by the end of the day if this is working or not and then i can move on from there but it also means that you don't find yourself into this sort of sunk cost fallacy of like oh, i've been trudging on the song for three weeks i gotta make it work because like now i'm just that much further behind you can sort of just go is it working is it not no move on yes cool it's in the game let's go next one you know right i mean it's like also you have to consider the fact that there's a hundred tracks on the stardew valley soundtrack so if each one of those took a day, that's a hundred days. Right. But like, also think about how many songs that I made didn't make it, you know, didn't make the cut. So that's a, that's a lot of time. Right. That's a lot of time. Right. Uh, just uh, a, a comment. Someone says, oh, snap, he's using a VST in this one. I think what you saw there, uh, user some guy, is actually the thing that we're using a VST to pipe the audio to me. Uh, we're using a VST plugin called Audio Movers, which is the... Yeah, um, I don't even I don't use VSTs. I don't even know what a VST. Oh uh, yeah, the is. listen to so that listen to is from audio movers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Did you say I, I don't even know what a VST is? Basically, it's like some kind of plugin that that you can use to do stuff. I don't I know. Swear, I don't, Eric, I don't use them. So. <laughs> I, I you're you're like you are. I I just want. I wish I could instill upon everyone the be like Eric mindset of just like. <laughs> Just do create. Don't get you know, don't get hung up on the the technicalities. We you know. Yeah, as... I remember when I was in bands, there'd be guys that were like way focused on the gear, right? There, it's all about like what oh, what pedal, what pedal rack do you have, and like oh, do you have what kind of amp do you have? Oh, I've got the orange, you know, special kind of amp or whatever. <laughs> right. And it's like I was always like whatever, man. I just have I get I, I'll have I have like a Squire, like whatever the crappiest like guitar. Yeah uh crappiest amp like who cares like it it's more about the music like you can you can make good That's music it. with any equipment right as long as you can it, it does what it needs to do it doesn't you know it doesn't really matter it having so good true. gear isn't going to make you a good musician 
No, no, that's right. That's right. And and having bad gear is not going to make a bad musician, a good musician sound bad. You know, the True. the uh, the one that jumps out to me, I see it more and more now in the uh, sort of guitar and bass communities is people are getting obsessed about the type of wood that these instruments are made out of. And I think it's a product of you know, a lot of the traditional woods that have been used in making instruments are becoming endangered and they're being put on like import lists. And so people are starting to branch out and like, oh, now we're going to make this out of cherry or um, type woods, like purple heart, and bubinga and like weird exotic <laughs> woods that weren't commonly yeah. used. And it has caused the that community or a, a segment of that community to obsess about like, Oh, but I I can't get that guitar. That's got the wrong wood, you know. And it's like, well, come on, you know. Especially when you're gonna yeah. like plug it into a high gain amp and crank up the distortion and like, not you know, it's the great equalizer. So <laughs> true. I mean, it's not it's not like I look down on it. It's like if people find that interesting, it's like sure. fine. I mean, sure. it's interesting. Uh, I I suppose. And it's like there's obviously you know I'm sure there's you know different timbers of the different wood that sound better or worse for different contexts, but. Uh, Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I feel like when when you're just getting into it, it's like just focus on the the heart and soul. You know what actually matters. That's such that's, good that's advice. Probably better. That's such good advice. And that and and I, you know, again, I we see that that mindset of yours is what people see when they play the game and experience Stardew Valley. Um, Nacho Nucleus just says QWERTY keyboard, one song a day, doesn't know a VST. Wow, great guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's true. I think that's sort of what I've been enjoying as well. It's it's a very refreshing sort of uh, way for, especially for people that sometimes feel trapped by, um, by being beholden to the the tech stuff that maybe they don't need to focus on so much. So let's check this out. So what I, I've already lost the plot. Which one did we pull up again? Okay, so this is uh, the wind can be still. It's one of the winter songs that is more of a synth kind of song. Oh, cool. There's not a lot. Of, I don't know if there's there's NNXTs, but these are like. I think this is one case where I didn't use the reason soundbacks actually because I wanted like very specific like '80s sounding synthesizers, and I got I don't remember where I got them from. Okay, but let's just play a little bit let's of check it. Check it out. Here's one of those glitters coming up. Oh, but it's cool. not really glitter. <laughs> Just a little uh Oh cool, yeah. Winter winds. Wow. Going. There was a there was a request. I'm gonna scroll back up okay. here to see if I can find it. Uh, just to put it on screen, if I can, I'll just mention it. Someone was asking to to look at the bass effects that are in this song. It's sort of yeah. Um, that is beautiful, by the way. I mean, I, you probably aren't seeing the comments I'm throwing up on screen as we're 
playing it, but you know, one person said it's like three songs in one, which it kind of is, you know, and, and has these different moods and different movements to it. Um, really, so, really gorgeous. Well, thank you everyone. Um, so yeah, here's the bass. <laughs> Someone says I would enroll in an Eric Baroni music course. <laughs> I think me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is the bass. I have this turned off, so it's really just a, a compressor and some and little some bit of reverb. A little bit of reverb. I'm noticing on all of your reverb, um, now I'm going to just zoom in for the audience to see. So there's a, a knob called dry wet, which is sort of how much reverb is, what's the blend between no spatial reverb on the sound and all spatial reverb. You tend to run that pretty subtle for, I mean, it, it's definitely a part of the sound, but it's not swimming in reverb. It's true I, I don't know why that is it's just what i do this is the right it's the right amount well i feel like when you go up any like even half it like there's no more you know hit to it anymore it kind of sounds very soft like but when i have it down here there's i don't know to yeah me it's right still bit... you get that little you get the little actual attack envelope of the sound that makes sense and so and this is uh so this is probably using one of those uh, I'm looking at the name of the sample. Sign is it sign? A saw bass. Okay, so it's a sawtooth waveform. Um, and honestly, with compressor, I have no idea what I'm doing with compressor. <laughs> I don't really understand compressor. I just I think when I made this, I read online that you're supposed to put compressor on bass. So I, <laughs> you know, that's about it. I, oh I don't really God. know if it's even. Eric, you are my creativity spirit animal. I just adore how instinctual and un <laughs> unput off by you know i mean I, I i work i mean i make these tutorials and stuff for the reason community so i tend to confront people who are reaching out into the reason community because they they don't understand compression either and they it's stopping them they literally don't go forward because like but what does it do and how do i use it and what are the right settings tell me the magic position to put those dials to do the thing that i feel I'm, my music needs and god if i could instill one thing into every music maker out there it would be that spirit that you have of i don't know it's but i heard you're supposed to put it on yeah, does so it I did. sound good i don't know if it sounds good it sounds good that's about <laughs> it um i don't even use compressor anymore to be honest like i was I, there was a period where i was making music and i was trying to use compressor because i read you're supposed to i don't even use it anymore like honestly i don't know maybe the new like uh reason instruments like i'll have it baked in already or something but yeah, some have it some don't but you know yeah. uh, the, the truth is especially for um a sound like this that you have it's not it's not super critical you know uh and i'm actually of your sort of mindset i I don't use compression on bass as much as the internet would tell you you're supposed to. Um, and it, it, does it need it? Does it not need it? I don't know. That's arguable. But it's like if the song's working, the song's working. And your song, right. in this case, it's working with it. I bet if you had if you had turned it off, you would probably just mix it a little differently and it would still be working, you know. So, um, well, let's see. What else? Um, there's some other stuff in there that I wanted to poke. Maybe actually, could we take a look at that the other the other um, gliss? What do we call it? Glitter. Just yeah, to, to hear yeah, that on this, its so own. This... It's very subtle. Yeah, it's just a like it's a it's, shaker almost, but like a. It's, it's a almost far a shaker. Away. It's a custom synth, I guess, that I made. Huh. Um, yeah, I see. It's. Boy. Yeah. So it's again, it's just like a little noise in the background almost that uh, just adds some texture. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's great. Well, um, I want to be mindful of your time. I'm, I'm keeping you on this live stream, I'm holding you hostage because I'm fascinated oh, by this stuff. It's no problem. Uh, but um, I wanted to, I've got a couple of uh, questions I've been flagging to from people as they've been going by. I want to get those your way. But I also wanted to, and again, I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you, um, there are people that are asking to hear about potential haunted chocolatier music that might be in the works. Is there anything that is, and it's okay if you say like, nah, nothing's really ready for public uh, consumption yet, but. 
no, there's definitely stuff. Um, let's see. I'm trying to decide if I want to show something that's kind of more somber or something that's upbeat. Cause I have like a, a boss battle song that's like basically finished, ready to go that I could show off. Okay. Or there's some ones that are more like uh, subdued, but well, the boss one has like more stuff going on, so that might be interesting. But sure, we'll. Uh, why don't we? You want to try the we boss can do one? Both too. I don't care. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe like we'll really do both. Doesn't... We won't. We won't dig deep into them. But maybe let's do both. Just to, I imagine people are kind of itching to hear what this stuff is uh, sounding like. Right. So you put out a trailer for Haunted Chocolatier, right? And so people have yes. gotten a little taste of of the music but this is true and it's like if anyone wanted to see the files for from the trailer too i could bring that up it's like if anyone's interested but oh sure one thing that's about um chocolatier which i would say is different than stardew is it's less of the nnxt sampler focused i think part of that is just the feel of the game um it's like has to do with you know ghosts and it's kind of a snowy town and all that it's kind of darker okay and so to me that implies more like like synths are more on the table. You know, I see. Like a, especially I see. with the ghosts, you know, like, I don't know. It's just my gut feeling. With Stardew, it was like, no, it was mostly, I don't want too many synths. I want it to sound very natural, organic. It was very, the game is focused on the seasons and on nature, but this is more, it's a little darker. It's, there's ghosts in it. And so I kind of feel like synthesizers make sense. There, now, when you I don't hear know. this song, like, everything I say sounds like it's thrown out the window because it's like, <laughs> it's not a ghostly song whatsoever. But. I don't know if, um, you know how much you've you've talked about chocolatier publicly but i'm getting the sense that you may have just uh teased some new information here because um audrey says boss battle and then shortly later shania said boss battle (laughs) so (laughs) yeah i don't think anyone i don't think i've mentioned that at all but there you go yeah this is this song is for like a a b a b boss okay (laughs) A bee bar is so fascinating. I don't want to. I don't want to force you to uh, reveal everything, but man, that is uh, fascinating. So as you can see, I made this song using a much uh, more. Re- this is after I upgraded Reason. I've got all these like Let's see. Uh, weird stuff. I got um, what is this? Europa oh, or whatever. Uh, I think there's an algorithm in there. I think I'm seeing, or maybe that's grain. A uh, grain. I think that's what that is. And a grain synthesizer. Yeah, so you've, well, look at that. Do you and are you ready to go with the sound? I think or? I am. I think I, yeah. Let's see if we hear it. Maybe let's listen to the song and then we can go look at the different. All right, this is Reason yeah. live stream exclusive, haunted chocolatier, new music. Let's check B-boss. it out. B boss. B boss. to a loop that is awesome now there is i i i almost i'm gonna i'm gonna pass you there's some speculation going on in the comments here and i almost it's maybe it's more fun just to let people wonder in speculation people are saying okay b boss what what does this mean a b boss does is if there's a b boss does that mean there's an a boss and then other people are going a b boss b e e like a b boss oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) so uh, i mean i think this 
might answer your question right uh, there. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll let, we'll let, <laughs> I think that does answer the question for some people. Yeah. There are people that are saying, you know, Oh, that sounds buzzy, you know, and, uh, uh, the YouTube user test just, uh, replied with seven B emojis. So, <laughs> Uh, but people are loving it here. You know, uh, 2D Rona says, what a banger. That trumpet is so great. I want to fight this boss. You know, I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, yeah, the trumpet. Um, is th fun. I got to use that, you know? Yeah. Like, like, how often you get to use that, right? Right. I, brrr, it's like from Super Mario 64. <laughs> like, makes, what makes me I mean, it sounds like uh, something off of Camila Cabello's latest album, too. She's got a lot of that sort of traditional... Um, Afro-Cuban horn stuff. That True, is the uh, the like uh, drums too are kind of like that. Uh, yeah, sort of salsa kind of. You know that thing. <laughs> but it's funny when you play it on its own like that. That sounds way more electronic than it feels in the totality of the song. I got the timbales. But there's some. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. That is. Uh. That is cool. That is super fun. And that's just. And again, you're. You're not necessarily doing research into, like, Afro-Cuban salsa or mariachi music oh. or anything like that. You're just sort of going. I, I. You sort of have a sense of an aesthetic you want, and you're just kind of playing with it and. And getting yeah, that, huh? I guess so. Yeah, I don't. I didn't do any research. It kind of just. I don't know. This is just the music that I made, and this is a music. This is a song I made like very recently, and it's like, you know, the Stardew music I made like ten years ago. So that's a long time. Right. Uh, there's okay. <laughs> there's a there's a request from someone who says, "How did you make the B sound? That one that you soloed and said this should probably answer your questions." Can we? I mean, that's literally like a Reason Sound Bank. <laughs> Look at it. Huh. I think. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, it's called Stone Bees. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's like. Now, I don't, I don't know this. The Reason community probably will know this better than I. But that dash G I in the name, um, that's the initials of a sound designer. So someone out there. With the initials GI made that sound, and they will be stoked to know that they're going to be uh, yeah. in the next. Uh, so I guess game. I found it by going to Reason Sounds, and then Textures. Okay, right. And then. And Stone were you? Bees. Uh, uh, did was it something where you heard the word, you saw the word bees in the title, and you're like, oh, that probably is something. Or I think I may have searched for bees. I ah. like probably typed in B because I was like. Uh, yeah. So just maybe to see if there was any uh, thing that sounded be and then I found this and I was like, "Hey, that's that's like, like kind of perfect because it's like a it's like a lead instrument, but um it sounds like a B, which yeah. kind of fits the what's going on." So That's amazing. That's amazing. Someone says it sounds like a Salazar Brothers throwback. Um I suppose it does actually. I guess I haven't thought about I if I if I went back and listened to some Sal Salazar Brothers music, I think you might be right about that. That is a uh, super Oh yeah. What's I that? don't know. Just... Someone else did ask. I, I it flew by in the comments yeah. here, but someone was saying, uh, "Could we? Is there are there any glitters in this uh, track? Just to hear kind of the variety of things that might be mm. used as glitter." Well, I don't. I actually don't know if there's any glitters in this track. I feel like the glitters uh, maybe they're more like in slightly more atmospheric tracks because this there's so much going on. You probably wouldn't even hear that. I mean, I might call this a bit of a glitter you know oh or, sure sure yeah yeah like even that oh right right exactly right it doesn't need to be <laughs> like those trumpets in the back are kind of a you know not strictly necessary but exactly exactly yeah um there you know the the uh, the stardew valley fans among us are getting very excited for this game now so uh your uh, sort of inadvertent uh hype machine is kicking into gear with this for sure i mean I, this, I even even i'm you know well I, i'm really excited to hear just how different this is than the stardew vibe in terms of you know and, and in, a, in a weird way you know i mean to go back to this concept of the 
<laughs> dare I call it the sophomore slump. It, it won't be, but you know, it, this does sound yeah. like your second album in a way. Like there is the, there's a continuity there, but it does feel like it's, it, you're, you're going, you're, you're making certain sonic changes in service of the game, I'm sure, but it also still sounds like you. No, I don't think anyone would doubt when they hear that, that that is the same creative mind that, that did some of the stuff we were listening to from Stardew Valley for sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Um, we could listen to another one. That's, uh, a, a totally different feel okay. just to show that like, you know, it's not, not like all the haunted chocolatier is like this total upbeat, uh, oh, yeah, salsa cool. music. Like, cool, that's, cool, not, yeah. that's not, the, that's actually like an, an oddball. Song, okay. That last one. Okay. But, uh, interesting. Um, yeah, let's see. I'm, I'll, I'll kind of just man the comments here while you get set up over there. Uh, Thriller Boy says, I'm dancing. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> this is true, actually. I, I realize if I, if I watch back this live stream, I do believe that every time you've hit the space bar to play some music, I just instantly start just bobbing up and down in my seat, you know? It is... Um... This one's not going to be like that, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but even the... I mean, you can bob up and down even to the, the slow ones. I've been sort of enjoying the slow ones as well. Let me just look at um, a couple of questions here. Oh, okay. While I while I get your thing set up here, I'm going to throw this question at you. Um, somebody, Unsurpassable Z, just asked a question for Eric. How do you feel your music creation has changed in the last 10 years? Which I think is a good, especially since that's when Stardew was started and now you've got this new stuff going on. Well, I think I've uh, actually moved more towards like, you know, kind of like synthesizers and stuff. Um, you know, with Stardew, I obviously did a lot of like organic sounding kind of just uh, almost like orchestral type of instruments. But um, gotcha. I don't know, I think, you know, partly I like have started listening to more like uh, electronic music, I think in the past 10 years, you know, like a lot of kind of like vaporwave type of stuff. Right. So it's like maybe there's some influence of that kind of like uh, vaporwave and post vaporwave type of music, I guess to some degree, gotcha. even though it's like that last song I played is nothing like that at all. But I think there's maybe an element of that. Um, gotcha. That's yeah. interesting. Okay. Well, let's, um, I, I am excited for the, uh, the, the audience, the, the concerned ape fan base to, uh, hear this next one. So this is what uh, do we, there's no setup for this, right? We don't, we don't, we don't tell people where this appears in the game or how or anything. It's just, no, no, it's called, this one's called pristine snow. And okay. that's just the file name. It's not necessarily what the... <laughs> right, now people are like, okay, so the game is about bees in the snow. Okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> cool, let's check it out. Oh, wait a second. I'm not hearing it. Hang on, hang on. Did okay. I do something wrong? I did something wrong. Let's start again. Sorry. No problem. Just tell me when, you, when I you're think good. I think I'm ready. Okay. No, wait a second. Am I... Did I do something wrong, maybe? Uh, let's double check here. I'm going to close. I'm going to close all of my things, and I'm going to just check the hang tight, folks. I'll jump over. Oh, you know what? Did I? I think I was bypassing. Oh, bypassing the, the yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Let's, let's try this again. Okay, let me pull up the link again. Sorry, hang on a second. Okay. got to pull the link up. That's funny. I, I realized, yeah, by you said these are new reason files, and the new default behavior for reason is to have that insert effects bypassed. Um, okay. And so that would be uh that would be true. Let's see. I'm going to bring this back up. Okay, let's just uh, play a little bit and see if we got it back. Yeah.
now it's just looping, but that's just a little taste. That's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Wow. That's kind of a little bit more in the Stardew Valley uh, fashion, I guess, where it's a lot of NNXTs and... And is that piano in NNXT or uh... the piano is actually a, I think it's a radical piano. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, there it is, yeah. radical piano. It's, so like uh... that's one of the that's one of the kind of you know newer recent things. At least it's new for me, but like sure. that it's I relatively kind of, new. I, I like it. You know, I use it a lot now. Yeah, radical. When radical piano came out in reason, it instantly became probably my. It's it's still one of my most used. But when it first came out just a few years ago. I was reaching for that constantly because it really has a nice, I mean, it sounds like a piano, sure, but it sounds like a, it's got character that is different than sort of, especially like if you're familiar with the NNXT, like five foot grand piano that is a default patch, like that sounds like a concert piano and radical piano sounds more, I don't know. Uh, it, yeah. It has more character, more depth to it, I guess. Yeah. More variety. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That is, um, that is super, super cool. Yeah, somebody says this sounds like many of my favorite Stardew Valley tracks. So so there you go. For people that were wondering if this was going to be a an all salsa uh, high no. energy. <laughs> that's one. That's a total outlier. The Most of the music in the game will probably sound kind of like this. It's like sort of a mysterious, somber, snowy feel. That's kind of the idea right. I'm going with. Right. This is it, supposed to sound like a, a mysterious night in the snow, you know? Hmm. The, uh, Minori asks, uh, or not masks, so she says, um, it's giving me RPG vibes. Uh, and I assume, uh, forgive me for having to ask, but I assume that's she's referring to role-playing games, right? RPG in that sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, and I think that there is a an element to your games that are sort of RPG adjacent, even if they're not literally role-playing games you know absolutely i mean that that's a, a huge influence so it's like uh yeah it, it yeah definitely something i'm drawing from that's cool um i'm gonna just check a couple other comments here but i listen the um i think we have we've kept you on the stream for about as long as i can you know in good conscience uh keep you from i i think even the fan community would agree that like I'm keeping you from more haunted chocolatier work. So I should, I okay. should let you go. But um, I do want to throw a couple other questions your way. Um, sure. If you could, um, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen and okay. I'll pull up just a couple of the things that I saw fly by. And, and I'll just mention to people, throw out, if you have any questions, throw them into the chat and I'll try and keep up. Chat's going fast today, guys. So uh, if I don't get to your question, I do apologize, but um, let's see what uh, people are saying. Um, oh, this one I thought was interesting, actually. Uh, let me jump over here to our joint view. So, uh, David, uh, Groenwood, if I'm probably butchering that name, he says, um, a question from a gamer. Why does the title theme of Stardew Valley sound like Rainbow Connection from the Muppets? And was that an inspiration of yours? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. that, that wasn't an inspiration. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, you know, it might even just be as I'll simple I'll have to as... listen to it and just see. Uh, I don't know. It might, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a direct sort of banjo, uh, thing there. It may just be that simple that like you, you use the same palette of sounds and you kind of, it evokes in some people those same references, you know? Um, and, and if I may banjo geek for a second, the banjo in Rainbow Connection was played not on a banjo, but it was played on uh, an instrument called a banjitar, which is a guitar that just has the the drum head of a banjo. So it, the part that he's referring okay. to is sort of coming at it from the same way that you're coming at your parts from a guitarist's mindset rather than a banjo player's mindset. Interesting. So, I mean, maybe there's uh, something there then. It might be something that there. Yeah. Kinda, yeah. yeah. Um, another question uh, not a question, a comment that I, I thought was nice. Um, it, it's sort of a, you know, a bit of a, a serious uh, question, but worth passing on to you, I think. Uh, Kimberly Hayden says, Stardew Valley helped me through the loss of my kid's father in 2016. The soundtrack was the balm my heart needed. Hours and hours of relief kept me grounded, so thank you. And I think that's a, a really kind of beautiful idea, and I, I it, it must be nice for you uh, to know that your music is sort of, filling a bigger role in people's lives than just entertainment even, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, to whoever left that comment, I mean, I'm glad that Sardi Valley was uh, soothing and helpful for you during that time. Yeah. Um, 
the let's see what a music associate was trying to i'll just bring this up i can't remember when this came in music associated with the characters in stardew valley is super powerful for their scenes as well the the is that is that uh something you deliberately did that there's a connection between the music the characters and the scenes that they all kind of have to have a cohesive um yeah so like each character i guess kind of has a certain feel to that character that i tried to capture in the music um, okay it's again it's a lot of it is just very like uh, intuition based you know right right related to that actually um the muggy buggy uh says eric do you use any music theory to help write your songs or do you go to the the beatles route and write songs or do you go the beatles route and just write what sounds good so. i guess the beatles route because i don't know any music theory whatsoever <laughs> really? i don't know i can't i can't read music i don't know anything about scales or anything like that it's all just uh, a feel that i've gathered over you know a lifetime of making music in an amateur way right right this is something i i often think about because i my music i come from a somewhat more trained not not highly trained but i do come from some amount of training the visual work that i do the editing and all the visual work i've done was totally just a an offshoot accident of you know somebody needed to uh edit a project and i knew how to work in in pro tools and things like that. So I became the video editor just because it was close enough to what I was doing. And what I've always thought about the work that I do visually there is that I have no clue what the correct rules are. I just, I've watched TV before, so I know kind of how it should look and feel and how to make the edits and the pacing feel right. And you just sort of go by instinct in that way. So yeah. I, I can very much relate to what you're saying there, though. I will say for someone that has no concept of musical theory like that vibraphone thing with those arpeggios that you're doing and you're going through those chords that's like a you you know you're winging <laughs> Is that it what they pretty teach damn in, well in music theory school i, I mean don't know. there would be i'm sure that there are people that could dissect what you're doing far better than me and you know and sort of go like oh he's look at how he's using the voice leading to kind of push and modulate to this you know key or whatever like there's probably a lot of stuff that you're doing without realizing that well, I think you're right. And I think that just speaks to the maybe the idea that, you know, the theory is based on some kind of intuitive, yeah. uh, you know, and you could you could come to the same thing without ever reading theory just because it is the thing that makes sense. Right. You know, it's uh, I don't know. I'm a big advocate for just intuitive thinking and, and what you were describing with the video editing. It's like, you know, just doing it by feel. I think often that produces a better result. Yeah, um, right. I wanted to ask you, there's a question, um, I think, I'm, I'm sort of reading on the fly while we're talking, so this may be n not what I think it says, but um, Vig Visage Studios asks, what advantages do you think you have given, uh, what advantages do you think you have, given you are both the creator and the composer? I'm on a dev team of three fellows, we'd love to know your mindset. Well, I mean, uh, with Stardew Valley and Haunted Chocolatier too, it's like I have complete creative control over everything. So the game is my exact vision, exactly how I want it to be, down to every note of the music. It's And I'm very particular about a lot of things. So it's like when it comes to the music, it needs to be just a certain way or else it bugs me. So it's like, I don't know. It's like if I didn't have that complete control... I feel like, you know, maybe the game wouldn't have as cohesive of a tone to it. But I mean, that's not to say that, you know, you can make a great game with a team. I am I know that's possible. I mean, a lot of the, you know, Harvest Moon, the game that Stardew Valley is kind of inspired by, it was not made by one person. It was made by a team. So, right. I think I think you can you can do it both ways. But I, I do really enjoy having that complete creative control over everything. And I think it does give my games a certain uh cohesiveness to every element right right now there is um i will i'll speak to the um the business-minded people out there as well there's actually uh an advantage for if visage studios for example you if you're three guys and you're making this game and you're ma making the music yourself um there's another advantage to that which is um so uh, there's a, a, a quick historical anecdote um the music for te uh what's it called tetris you know um that was a landmark piece of music because the guy who made the music for Tetris got in his contract, he got a royalty and then Tetris became Tetris. I mean, it was like this huge game and he made a lot of money on it. And the game industry kind of as a whole kind of thought like, huh, now let's, let's not do that ever again. And so 
a lot of, if not all, I think it's safe to say all music that's done by music contractors for game companies are done as work for hire. You make the game, but the company owns the work product. You as a creator, you still own the music you made. It, it's a, it's one of the more rare instances where you don't surrender the sort of creative IP of that music because you're delivering it to yourself as the, as the game developer. And so for people like Visage Studios as well, if you guys are making the music yourself, there are obvious advantages to that. Um, just in terms of what you now have the flexibility to do with the music as the music creator that you wouldn't, if you were the, if you had outsourced it to somebody else, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I think that would bug me a lot to make music and then have to just give it to someone else. And then it's, it's theirs now they own it. Like, yeah. I don't know. That would kind of bug me. And then me. you hear, I, you know, like, a future in, you know, Stardew Valley version 4.0, you hear derivative works and it's like, wait, that's not me. That's right. No. Derivative works. Or I, I see it in a McDonald's commercial <laughs> yes, or something, right, you know, right. it's like, I didn't approve of that, you know? So I, it, it is true. I like having that full control over everything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And ownership, I guess. Right. Right. Um, let's see. Um, oh, um, Kelly Pembroke, uh, Kraus asks, asks are there any of your smaller pre Stardew Valley games that are available to check out and play? Do they live anywhere? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there's, it's possible, you know, I, I'm not going to like promote it, but like there are ways that you can play. Uh, I think at least two of the games that I made beforehand and they're, they're kind of cringe, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but so if people want to do the detective work, they're out there. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Well, um, there you go. Uh, maybe maybe some people will kind of dig in and find some of that. Um, let's see. A couple other things. Uh, oh, you know, just some, here's some uh, standard kind of stuff. Someone asked, who's your favorite? Oh, no, we asked you that. Who's your favorite Stardew Valley character? Right, we got I that can't one. answer. You can't answer that one. That's right. Um, oh, just, just a comment here. Uh, composer Carmen says, Eric, you are awesome. Thanks for a wonderful game. Lots of inspiration. Uh, I Thank think, you. I think that's true. Um, did I ask you this one already? Maya asks, um, what do you wish you'd known when you were starting out in this career and role? Hmm. Well, I wish I had known more about the way that the game industry works. You know, like I was very naive to all of that, um, especially as a complete outsider who didn't have like any game dev friends. I didn't know anyone in the industry. So, I mean, I guess there's certain aspects to, you know, like business and all of that stuff that, uh, I wish I had known, like if I could go back in time, I would do some things differently. I mean, I can't get really into the specifics, but, sure, sure. um, you know, I, I, I sometimes, you know, uh, say that I'm glad at how much of an outsider I was, you know, I think in some ways it gave me a unique perspective, a unique approach to everything. Um, and I wasn't like following trends and stuff. Cause I just didn't, I didn't pay attention to what like really was going on in the indie game world at all. Mm. But there are also some aspects of like, you know, I think it pays to to not be naive, I guess, like to to to, you know, maybe like reach out to someone who is already established and, you know, maybe they would give you advice. It's like, you know, if, if someone reaches out to me and says, you know, like I'm an indie game developer and I, you know, do you have any tips or whatever? Like I I usually re will respond, you know, at least when it comes to the type of stuff that I wish I knew. Um, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. that makes sense. That makes total sense. Um, a uh, question from Ethan, uh, and maybe we'll just ask this, and maybe one more or something. But uh, he says, um, "How do you balance your time with solo creating everything? Do you side? Do you decide today is a music day, or do you wing it and sort of let inspiration drive your time each day?" Uh, I wing it, and that's one of the great things about being a solo dev and being able to do all these different things. Is like if I'm in a mood. I just follow that mood. You know, if I feel like doing music, I do music. Um, sometimes it'll be like, you know, I'm working on a thing and I'm like, okay, I've done everything else for this like area of the game, but I would really, it's not going to come together until I add the music. And I might then decide like, okay, I'm going to work on music until I have something for this area or whatever. Right. Right. Cool. All right. Last question. I think this is a, a fitting, uh, almost throwaway one to, to end on. Um, True Vulgarian says, so what is the biggest thing that concerns <laughs> concerned ape? The biggest thing that concerns me? <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know. I guess just, uh, I guess there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, 
you know, I guess human uh, arrogance and hubris. That's maybe what I would say. Okay. All right. That's good. All but right. I'll leave that kind of vague. So yeah. they can interpret it the way they want. Perfect. Perfect. I think that's the, the perfect, perfect answer. Well, listen, Eric, um, I'm, I'm going to put out a request here for you. Do you still have one of the, it can be almost any one of the songs, but do you have one of them still open or maybe the last one that you had open? Is that still in reason? Uh, yes. Could we maybe, could you set up a loop and we're going to use it as our outro music here today? Okay. And like... yeah, just get it going. And maybe if you could pull the master fader on the mixer down a little bit to sort of, uh, we're going to, I think you just, yeah, perfect. Wherever you got it right there. Okay. That's good. Okay. Perfect. Now with that in mind, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say goodbyes to our audience. I'm going to say some goodbyes to you here. I want to thank you so much, really, from the the two communities that have come together in this stream. The Reason community, the Stardew Valley community, the which the overlap communities of Reason users who love Stardew Valley or Stardew Valley players who love music and love talking about music. So I think everyone is so thankful of the time that you've given us to hang out with us today it's been awesome well it, it's been a pleasure ryan thank you you're a great host uh it was fun it was entertaining and we talked about a lot of interesting stuff and we did? Uh, yeah also I'm... thanks to everyone at reason for making this software that i've been using for you know at least 15 years now and made the stardew valley soundtrack possible so that's awesome i'm and and they you know i'm gonna say on behalf of them uh you are welcome and they're just so thankful to have, have been a part a small part of your success story and, and inspiration and help and what, you know, the tools that you've relied on. That's just fantastic. So Eric, I'm going to switch over to my main cam. I'm going to say goodbye to the folks there. You keep that running and I'll see you on the other All side right. of the broadcast to, to say some goodbyes to you guys. Sounds good. Thanks for sticking around for the Le reason live stream. There's been some people here have been from minute one. They've stuck through the whole, God, we've been on two hours, my God. But, uh, if you haven't, if you caught on late, if you tuned in late, this whole live stream lives, you know, it's going to be archived and just on our channel. And if you're new to the reason live stream and you've enjoyed just hanging out and having this discussion, maybe not even just about Stardew Valley, just about music in general, the creative process, things that inspire us and, and maybe some of the tech and maybe not some of the tech, maybe some of the conceptual stuff. If you've enjoyed this, I'm going to throw out the, Hey, subscribe to our channel because we do these live streams. We're going to be doing these uh, on a, semi-weekly or sometimes weekly there's you, you can check on our on the blog on reasonstudios.com we have a full schedule of what's coming between now and sort of mid-june and there's a lot of great guests we're gonna have a lot of fun with everybody just like we did today so if you're new here subscribe and and keep an eye out because we'd love to have you it's these are just super fun to do and super fun to hang out with everyone and so thank you everybody for sticking around with us again major thanks to eric and uh we're going we're gonna to go out. I'm going to see you soon. I think in two weeks I see you again on the Reason live stream. Take care, guys. See ya.